Okay, thank you everybody. Um, boy, what a great day we have had. We had probably about 40 people here who really had some creative thoughts both uh, uh, about all of our facilities and the relationships of our, our facilities. And so it's been a very productive day um, trying to be uh, as thoughtful and creative as we can and aware of our uh, current conditions and, and where we would like for our learning spaces to be in the future. So we have new faces here. Glad that you could join us this afternoon. I think I will be turning it over to um, Judy Hoskins with the Cunningham Group. And each of the groups have prepared a presentation to go through and share what their ideas are for our playing facilities. But I think Judy is going to um, introduce our afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Willman. And thanks again, everybody, for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, I know it's hard to break away from your schedules, but um, we're very grateful to have all of you here. So. Our purpose today was to co-create conceptual design strategies for each site, utilizing the common themes and parameters from the last symposium, along with the shared facility vision, facility principles, standards, and gap analysis from symposia one and two. Can I have a show of hands for those of you that participated in previous symposia, or maybe it's easy, okay, there you go. All right. For those of you who um, this is your first introduction to this experience, a lot, a lot of work has gone into um, this day, and we've taken a lot of time to lay the groundwork and a foundation that is really grounded on the right priorities here at Eans ISD, and that is learning, and the learning that you want to have happen here and the expectations that you want to have when your students leave Eans ISD for the changing world that they are entering. And so, John, if you hit the next one. Uh, this is the agenda that, um, that we've kind of been using over the last couple of days. Um, we always bring everybody up to date in terms of where we've been and where we're going. Um, we, always, we always review the master plan the vision and the purpose for a master plan and the value of a master plan. This is the schedule uh, that uh, we have been working with and, and Stephen, I don't know. Okay. We are, as you look at this schedule, we are in June, so we are kind of midpoint in this process. We are working together to create options. We, you know, a master plan, you start at a very high level and each time you gather, you drop it down in altitude and you get more and more specifics. And the more specifics you get into, the more questions that arise. Um, and so we are now starting to get in, into an altitude where we are looking at the individual sites and what it means to be able to support 21st century learning at each site throughout the district. It's always important to model what we preach. And as we think about the attributes that these learners are going to need in order to be successful, in a global knowledge economy, collaboration, creativity, innovation, critical problem solving, communication, curiosity, citizenship. Those are all skills on top of the traditional skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic that we're trying to support. So we try to model the collaboration that we are trying to instill in our learners, and the master planning process is no exception. It, too, needs to be very collaborative. It is your master plan. And that's why each and every one of you have been asked to participate 
in this process because you each bring a unique perspective. And your schools need to serve the entire community. We can no longer afford just to have schools that serve children aged kindergarten through 12th grade, particularly when you're trying to get community support around your facilities. Let's take a look at how they can be resources for the entire community. We started by crafting a shared vision for the purpose of a master plan. It reads as follows. Eanes Independent School District will provide for its community of learners facilities and environments that foster collaboration and enhance engagement, exploration, and purposeful application for deep, lifelong learning. So much has changed than when your schools were originally built. We liken it to, uh, you wouldn't walk into your doctor's office and expect it to look like it did 50, 60 years ago, and yet so many of our schools do. EISD will have technology-rich, energy-efficient, fiscally responsible, and financially sustainable facilities that provide opportunities for student choice in creative and enriching activities and promote the involvement of the greater Eanes community. The engagement of the learner is so much more active and participatory than it was, again, when many of these schools were built. Um, we liken it to using the word, our learners are now actively engaged in the construction of their learning versus the instruction. It was just a one way, which is the industrial model. The facilities will provide furniture, tools, and workspaces that are forward-thinking, flexible, and adaptable for relevant meaningful and personalized learning. This speaks to the fact that all children can learn, but recognizes that all learn differently. How do we tap into each of their passions and really make it a meaningful experience for each and every child so they, they carry that, that hunger and that passion for learning throughout their lives? Facilities and environments will allow the intentional design of experiences and life skills necessary for each student's future in a global community. Again, that speaks to the fact that our learners are not just competing with others from around town, from around the state, from around the country, but truly with others from around the globe. So how do we do that? Aligned with your mission. Again, the master plan that you are working on is tailored uniquely to the Eanes ISD. It's not going to look like any other master plan because your community is unique. We want to celebrate it. We want to tap into the unique resources that are here. And this just speaks to the fact that it's grounded in your mission and beliefs, your parameters, objective strategies, again, before we ever start talking about base, we always focus on the learner first and those skill sets that you want to instill in those learners so that we can provide the right kinds of learning activities and finally the right kinds of space to support that. Supported by best practices, you had quite the week with Sir Ken in town for your iPad Palooza. There's a lot of research that's out there. We had many conversations that kind of tapped into the latest research that's out there around how children learn best. Built on common ground, as we continued our conversations together, together, there were a number of common themes that kept surfacing. Planning parameters. Uh, these, as we continue to move through the process, a, a set of parameters was developed that again guided the activities today. The board weighed in on the parameters last night. And let's just uh, let's first of all define what a parameter is according to Wikipedia. Yes, in its common meaning, the term is used to identify a characteristic a feature, 
a measurable factor that can help in defining a particular system. In this case, the master plan. A parameter is an important element to take into consideration for the evaluation or for the comprehension of an event, a project, or any situation. We got some great insights from the board last night on the parameters that the master plan task force had created. Let's go through those. First one, provide for 21st century learning. As you look at that definition, requires attention to indoor, outdoor space technology and furniture. The board asked us to make sure we recognize that outdoor learning is a high priority here at Eads ISD. It's part of that very first parameter. Much easier to do here than in Minnesota, I might add. <clears throat> Provide for the range of student-driven program opportunities within enriching activities. The basis for that one. Enriching activities are shown to support student success. Programs have become deeper and more robust, and enrollments have expanded significantly since the schools were built. However, space has not kept up evenly. Examples include fine art space at middle school, robotics, dance, lacrosse, community use of fields and spaces. When our schools were first built, again, that industrial model, really the, the set of programs that were offered was very limited. Now, there's so many more programs that our schools provide that have spatial implications and site ramifications. The third one, plan for equity among schools in the same level, travel time, program offerings, and enrichment opportunities. That item, um, if you had been to our first community forum, that was something that was really um, uh, verbalized strongly, is we need to make sure that, that we are providing equity across, across our sites. Equity for students within the district's neighborhoods. Large distances reduce family involvement and volunteering. A lot of research is out there about the important role that families play in the learning experience and the success of their students' learning. So let's make sure our schools are accessible. So to that end, um, this was a theme that has continually surfaced and that the board asked us again to make sure that we reinforce within this parameter, and that is to consider a new elementary school to serve the west side, again, in support of those parameters. Next, maintain the same grade level organization that you have so everybody feels that that grade organization is serving the district well. However, we might want to consider smaller settings for the middle schools. Again, that is a theme and a suggestion that has surfaced that folks feel would really, um, that it deserves further investigation and research. And so you'll see that this afternoon. Plan for moderate enrollment growth. Um, the demographer study that was done uh, had different levels, and it was decided that we really need to plan for moderate growth in order to, again, deliver on that vision and be responsible stewards for the district. School size, elementary schools should trend toward five or six round size with a four section minimum to narrow the size range from what exists. And, base, and John will explain that a little bit more a little later. Um, but essentially, we're trying to make our elementary schools more um, consistent in the population that they serve. Reduce unrelated district functions located on the Westlake High School property to regain land for high school functions. There's a lot of varied uses on the high school property now land is tight, it's squeezed, let's make sure that we are um, serving the high school functions first and foremost. Next. <coughs> House students, children, and staff in permanent quality construction. No portables. Okay. What the board asked us to do on that one is said, you know what, that's pretty 
important. It's something we've been talking about for quite some time that needs to be moved up on the list. And if everybody or anybody wants to contribute or augment to what I'm saying, please feel free to do that. Um, the next three, provide early childhood learning facilities to support early learners, residents, and staff. The next three um, are are those items that the board felt, well, and also, as you see, are lower on the list, so that they're perhaps, they're important, all of these are important, but perhaps they're of a little less priority. Did I capture that right, board members? As resources that serve the entire community, develop facilities that support learners of all ages. And again, that speaks to the fact that really our schools are resources for the entire community. How do we make that happen? And lastly, consider expansion of public, public and public-private partnerships. How do we leverage the unique resources that you have here within EANS ISD to make it a win-win so that we pool our, our resources together and get really the, the largest bang for the buck that we can? There were some additional items for consideration that arose. And you can see how these now were integrated back into the parameters. Um, some of them, in any case, leverage the River Hills property to address challenges. How do, we, how do we take advantage of that site? Can it accomplish any of the parameters that we saw in the previous images? Consider a new elementary school. Okay? Consider a smaller setting for middle school students, possibly through academies or a third middle school. Consider the highest best use for the shared forest trail valley view property. Consider opportunities for combining district support functions. You can see here now again where that outdoor um, as well as indoor learning environments was really something that um, was asked to be recognized at that very first parameter. And finally, consider academies for the high school and the middle schools to support the district vision and mission, support the facilities vision, principles and standards, and manage enrollment pressures. So, then we did some scenario planning, and this was at the last symposium. John's going to kind of share the highlights of the results of what the um, master planning task force came up with. Thank you, Judy. Um, I'm going to go through these really quickly. I'm not going to even talk about um, any of the six in particular, but at Symposium 3, we had, um, again, creative work uh, done by your, your teams at six, uh, six creative teams. Uh, did some scenario planning for the, for the district. And so we had six options looking at the district from a very high level. We, you know, we, last night at the board meeting, we did present each of the six, and the, the specifics within each one um, will come out in the next Symposium 3 report. But um, we wanted to get quickly to the, the good stuff of the, scenario, of the six scenarios, which was the common ground that all six teams working on the master plan task force um, uh, really created this had the same design solution at for the district at an overarching level and and we use the exercise to define where the common ground is in, within a community so what is common and we also seek out what is unique and special that catches our attention that might be a really interesting design solution that might uh, bubble up um, out of the edges so the common ground I just want to review really quickly all teams created additional space um, to support the growing needs of the district and the, and the demographic pressures. All teams upgraded learning spaces at all sites for 21st century learning, including uh, furniture and remodeling, etc., to support that. All teams created a new River Hills Elementary School serving the west side of the district to meet that parameter. All teams created a community center either on the Shriner or the Westlake site. All teams uh, weighed in on CDCs in various ways, 
um, either centralized or um, regional or at each elementary school, but CDCs appear to be a priority with, within the district. And all, all teams relocated the transportation and maintenance building um, to free up space around the high school and used uh, many uh, um, recommended a satellite locations serving the west side that proved to be efficient. Um, all acknowledged that uh, something would have to be done with attendance boundaries to adjust population bases closer to the schools they serve at some point in a 10-year window. Um, all moved non-academic functions away from the high school, um, which, you know, a function that might not be related to the high school. All, um, all six repurposed either Valley View or Forest Trail for either a variety of district functions, one for a new middle school, one left it as an elementary school that would serve as a um, staging area for construction. But all recognize this sort of uh, anomaly of having two elementaries that are right next to each other, one serving a remote population. Um, they acknowledge that they, they freed the discussion from uh, limitations of money for the purposes of thinking creatively about the district in the long term. They felt the need to recognize that, and they found uh, most found limited use for the Baldwin property in the next 10 years. I think uh, one or two located something there. But those were the, that was the common ground of, of that exercise. And then three things really caught our attention uh, from the exercise. And uh, the first was the idea of creating a third middle school. In this case, it was recommended that it be, a, be at Valley View. And we, uh, you'll see what that looks like today. To, in, to increase enrichment choices for all of the middle level students. So this is the idea of uh, um, extending choices to middle school students and not asking them to specialize. Um, you know, so soon. And regional, uh, so the, also the idea of a regional, regional CDC centers that would serve the east and west side. The CDCs at, at all the elementaries, I think they're at three right now, but they put a lot of pressure on those elementary schools. They take up a lot of space that are going to be uh, problematic in terms of, um, uh, we have very limited site sizes here. Um, so there's very limited growth opportunities. So there's this challenge of how do we accommodate CDC uh, within the existing sites. And so we were interested in the idea of regional centers. Um, and then an idea of a food truck village at, the, an, at or adjacent to the high school, which would sort of create this uh, entrepreneurial um, uh, relationship or partnership or kind of a low cost solution for for, for something innovative, so we thought that was sort of cool. Um, so those things caught our attention. Now, um, we're, we're about to get into the, the presentation. Um, we're gonna start off with um, what you want. Um, this is a district, our work, we've been here for six months now, and it seems to us that as a district, um, and as a community, it's really clear to us what you want. Um, the, the desire for 21st century learning and the shared vision, the articulation of the shared vision has, uh, has been very clear and the common ground is so rich here. So that seems very clear. And then what you have um, is essentially a district that is very traditionally made of of what we would call cells and bells and traditional classrooms on uh, traditional corridors in sort of opposition to what you want. Um, and so you have all these schools and I just wanted you to recognize the pattern of a traditional school and then what you have, and you can see that pattern pretty clearly in all of your facilities. Now, Eanes Elementary and Cedar Creek break, break that pattern, you can, you can see that in but they're still sort of classroom pods, um, but not a lot of flexibility, not a lot of uh, variety in those in those diagrams. And so the uh, and this is the high school um, 
the lower level and, the, um, and, and, and in regard to the academic learning space where the teaching and learning is going on is that traditional sort of pattern of sales and bills. Um, and the high school has a, you know, a great deal of uh, uh, specialized space as well and it doesn't really follow that pattern. But, uh, so that's what you have and so the question is what can we do with what we have? And what you're about to see is what you, what you can do. And, uh, you can do a lot and we have just been totally impressed with the effort that is going on here today. Teams have uh, uh, been grappling with how they can create 21st century learning environments at each of their, at each of the sites. They've been working collaboratively with great creativity, um, with a, a sort of a, a, a kit of hearts approach. And we have asked, so we've had, um, I think, five teams working, and, we, and so two elementary schools have worked together to de design their schools, so we've, they've been working in teams. And the, the middle schools worked together, and then we had a big team working on the high school. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up the, uh, um, uh, the first elementary school team, uh, Oh, we're going to go middle school, so he'll kind of, let's do the middle school team to start. And we'll uh, plug in, and they all have iPad presentations. Of course they do. Okay, don't be distracted by all the colored blocks. I'm just going to hit some highlights for you. I'm going to talk to you about Hill Country, and then Mr. Ramsey's going to talk about Westridge, and then the um, proposal for a third school. Um, oh, right here. All right, any second now? It's thinking. There it goes. This is Hill Country. Um, let me orient you. Uh, this is Walsh Charlton, so this is the front of the building, if you will, and then you can see the back sort of the turf and track. The things that I want to highlight for you are some common themes. What we did was we pretended like we could knock down all the walls and keep basically the existing um, footprint, if you will. Um, the things that we did differently we decided, we talked about the importance of having uh, the classrooms grouped by grade level. The whole idea of having sort of neighborhoods where you can group and regroup and, and move students around um, based on curriculum need, not based on a bell schedule or based on a footprint of the cells and bells as you saw earlier. So one of the things that quickly came to our attention was that there really isn't enough space for the 950-ish students we have. So we kind of got dreamy. Um, we decided that we were gonna go up. We were gonna add a layer on the top and that was gonna be where sort of the eighth graders were. The um, science labs were all going to be contained in one building because we feel like that's a very specialized type of, of learning environment. Um, and then we found a space for sixth and seventh grade. It's kind of these blue and purple right here. Those are classrooms. Um, the other thing that we um, have realized is we don't really have enough space for our fine arts programs. Our fine arts programs are amazing. Um, so we got creative again, and we took out the tennis court and put in a fine arts, performing arts building. Dedicated this area to uh, music and drama, because if you've been in our building, the drama spaces are interesting to say the least. So gave them some really good space, and then turned this area, which is currently music, into a whole visual arts area, which would also have some room for sort of some graphic design types of things, because we imagine that that's going to uh, grow and explode. The other thing is that this area right here is our cafeteria, these four blocks. But if you've ever been in the Hill Country cafeteria when all the children are in there, well, you can't fit them all in there, but if you've ever been in there during lunch, it's pretty close quarters. So we extended it out um, to give it more space. Those were our themes. 
that just sort of popped out. I'm going to kick it to Mr. Ramsey and he's going to talk about how Westridge did a similar activity. There you go. And then he's going to talk about the third school. Okay, so the best thing that I think that we can and came up with at Westridge is we like our building. It's pretty good. Uh, it's got lots and lots of light compared to every campus I've ever been on any. So the staff and the parents are with us definitely felt like we need to keep it bright and sunny like it is. We like the structure, we like the setup. It works pretty well, so 25, 26 years ago, they did a great job building Western. One thing they did not anticipate was the huge growth of our fine arts program. Our fine arts is housed right here right now. We have between choir being over 300 students, band being about 150, and orchestra being about 100, which is about twice as big as most 5A high schools. Uh, we feel like we needed to have an upgrade. So what we did, we do have land out here in the parking lot. Doesn't bother in Burgess Coverage. We're all good to go. We would definitely build a very nice fine arts structure. That would alleviate a lot of issues that we have under the two school plan as we currently are with two middle schools. Because once you built, you know, took care of choir, you took care of orchestra, you took care of band, that'd be about three ensemble halls you'd have to build. Also finally get enough practice rooms get enough uh, space in there for storage. Obviously with that many kids with instruments, it's a very big deal. We could also loosen up in what happens in the fine arts and make this part of our school much more viable for all of our students because we could now move a lot of our electives. The blues are electives in different classes, the green with GT. Coming over here, we could like to put our foreign language classes. We've added Chinese, we've added French, along with Spanish and Latin to really make this area over here kind of more functional. All right, you have admin, you walk in, of course, you have the cafeteria and our gyms. Felt like that was pretty well set up like that. Now, the one thing that we did start to do, space for our teachers and that's the red right here let's go ahead and have one area for our science teachers to meet to have their professional learning community periods right then and there very nice space for us to set up without a doubt and also to keep some of our special education which is our green areas like they are we have a pretty large special education population we felt like it was set up very very well we'll talk more about that in a second so this kind of takes care of one hallway there's no set no first floor underneath this one Underneath here is where you do get to come on the first floor. We kind of had already set up where you have a lot of your eighth grade and seventh grade classes already together. So it felt like, at least on the second floor between the library and different spaces, with redistribution, we definitely can get a lot of classrooms together by content areas. And one thing that we did over here, not only to make more collaborative spaces for our teachers, and they're very excited about this, this is probably the best room we have. As Mr. Rager will tell you, and Ms. Bowerman, it oversees Barton Creek. It's lovely, has windows on two different sides. Let's make that a space where our teachers can go. And the idea that came out of something today, and you always get ideas come about, not only are we in the professional learning community period, but we felt like, why don't we go ahead and do our collaborative areas by grade level as opposed to subject like they're going to be meeting already for one period. That way, you're getting interdis interdisciplinary 6th, 7th, and 8th. And then you're also giving your subject people different times. People want to go to these areas, and the teachers over here definitely verify that for us. So over here, we we're going to push out some peer and beam stuff. I don't know what they were talking about on construction. Sounded like a great idea to make our first large meeting room where teachers could lecture together. One teacher might lecture while other people have small group breakout rooms, really do assessments at the beginning of the week, and then break out into this big, huge room and kind of have different kind of center set up even for your sixth, seventh, and eighth graders based upon what needs that they uh, see after that assessment. So really kind of do some more grouping. Down here, we felt like this is kind of our special education. We can definitely keep it there. But something down on the first floor that's very unique to Westerns, we have some great green space that no one can get to. In between these two uh, corridors right here, you have outside windows, but down here in a workroom, 
there's one door that gets you outside into a very nice courtyard. So you have about 12 rooms looking to one courtyard with nowhere to go. So we're actually going to open that up. And what we thought about doing was making it a collaborative area for the kids to work down on the first floor that would be combined between the two. And that would be where their flex space was, not only the library, but a place for them to really go, go have a take, mingle, be collegial, things that all the kids told us they want. So we definitely deliver that to them down here and give them that outside learning space, give them that idea to get outside. So, and then we just add more classrooms and another, once again, another collaborative setting there for the teacher. So we felt like things were pretty good at West Church, and we definitely could improve as well. Now, the new idea about the third middle school, and I kind of brought this up at our last symposium, is what we could do possibly at Valley View. We talked about the elementary school all the time, maybe the new high school 10 years ago, all that kind of good stuff. Well, let's talk about really reducing the number of our middle school students. The self-selection that we see go on with sixth graders or 11, we think is rather intense for an 11 year old to make, out the, make up their mind what they're gonna major in college and what path they're gonna do. We want more uh, opportunities for kids to really explore, getting the numbers down, really grasping all the kids that we can. Uh, a lot of research has been out there, especially the forgotten middle, about what happens in middle school really determines what you do in high school. And we've gotta start maybe giving a little more emphasis to that. So. Today was great, we're here at Valley View, went and walked the building with the Westridge uh, folks, just kind of see what we could do, and we feel like we could definitely make this into a viable third middle school for sure. Out up at the top, this is like you're looking at Valley View this way, up top at the yellow, uh, and also the green and blue, what we felt like we could bid out there where the portables are for the CDC, let's make that into a fine arts facility. Let's make sure we have three great structures at three good middle schools, and really expose our kids to as many of the fine arts as we could. And so that was kind of the premise we have room to build, that would be a great place to put that. We keep administration up here, keep cafeteria. What we decided then to do, the opportunity is let's have three different kind of neighborhoods as well. Let's do six, seven, and eight. So down here on the first floor, we have some science rooms, a collaborative space, uh, whatever units you need for special education, really address all of them, make it as cohesive for all the kids to be around each other as much as possible, but also, have a lot of classrooms because what we did if you know the library is on the first floor we moved the library up to the second floor to make it a very long interactive type library where we walk in and that's where we have all the computers set up for them ipad stations the flexible furniture to really make that second floor their space to make sure they feel real good once they go upstairs about having that space so what we did up here is you go to the top of the stairs you could have seventh on one side eighth on one side they're kind of set up the same we have labs together four labs in a row take care of most of those students and of course you have more of your collaborative type space for your special education students, collaborative space on the end as well for your teachers to kind of get once again that neighborhood feeling along the way. <coughs> Cafeteria would stay the same, uh, Coach Bennett, Bob Servi, and then also that Darren Almond. we went out and walked everywhere today to make sure we could fulfill the need of athletics. And so we definitely felt like out here we have enough space to do a little renovation on the gym that already exists that would be comparable to the one ones at Hill Country and also the ninth grade center. We would have to build another gym to make sure we're equitable. And we went and walked the football field today to make sure we would have a good sized practice facility out there for all of our teams that need some sort of turf or grass to go to. So we felt like we could definitely accommodate seven, 750 kids on this campus as well with addition of a third middle school. So. <coughs> Um, Julie, do you, do you want to facilitate? Um, anybody have any questions for the middle school team? Or we thought we would move through the presentations fairly quickly. But any questions for the group? Maybe it'll come back later. I'm trying to connect where this academy's idea is with the new school. Are they in the same concept or are they two different directions? There are different options. Yeah, there are different on that. Might we'll uh, maybe wait for the high school to weigh in on that because there's varying thoughts about that. So. And the middle schools, we thought you know, this would definitely be a spot to go give you the representation if we went to the academy around what that would look like with a third campus for sure. Steve, I understand you said that at West Ridge, the organization is built by. It's sixth grade main on the first floor, they're kind of in a U shape. But then when it comes to seventh and eighth, all eighth upstairs, seventh is kind of between both floors. And the new thing, it works real well just because some teachers have been there for a while. And I just think that 
it flows real well for the kids too, the way they use the stairs inside and outside. The eighth graders kind of limit themselves to the inside. Six and seven kind of going outside. If the six lead, they just have to go sign and back. So it works out pretty well functionally right now. For sure. Yes. Um, I apologize if everybody else in the room knows the answer to this, but I don't understand the connection between uh, a third middle school and changing the way in which kids take their path to high school. Maybe that's related to the question from the Greer. You know, are you saying it's a I guess the best way to say it is right now, there's kids who are 11 when they come, when they show up at West Virginia Hills Country, who kind of selected a path that will remove them from maybe taking other options when it comes to maybe expose themselves to fine arts more than just the first year in sixth grade, or maybe playing a sport longer, or maybe, you know, being involved with orchestra. Whatever the case is, whether it's even getting involved with robotics or taking that foreign language, or with a smaller atmosphere with still as many as adults on campus, you can maybe reach those students and give them more opportunities and more options. It's not a differentiated program or magnet or whatever. It's not yet. Cool. There's, there's that the model. The idea would be that by having smaller numbers of kids, you would be able to get more kids to keep their options open. Yes, longer. and they'd be more involved okay. at a higher rate. Because we just have, okay. I just know, you know, when the lists go out and who made what choir, right. who made what orchestra, we already have I kids who go and say, I'm going to opt out. Even though there's a plan five or six years, so we just, the kids may okay. remove Thank themselves. You. Thank you. We did discuss that, yes, and we even talked about how you would probably use the Valley View as one of those kids would be a little more centrally located. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that is we felt like sometimes with the sixth grade, they'd have to transition to sixth grade, then it's transition to seventh grade. And so that was kind of one negative, but we definitely brought that up as well. That this would be a viable place to do that, to allow them to make, make better decisions when they yeah. do start making things in seventh grade. We'll so, research this. Yes, definitely. That, so. <laughs> yes, there's no doubt about it. That would be a good thing. Instead of having a ninth grade student, we actually have a true sixth grade. Can I ask a clarifying question yeah. on the three? If if you because you looked at all, you know, either two or three on the three, did you did you recommend three equal sizes? We were looking at three equal ones, yes. Okay. And it would probably be kind of bound by attendance zones and how that would look. But we definitely felt like just to kind of spread it out. We definitely had a pretty good representation of all the pockets of the community put in those schools. Yes. The children. We hope everything's going to be well over 950. We're, wow. We should be at 900 by the next year or two, easily. so those are getting larger than originally. Yes? And I was just going to say, we did look at like just making an academy, then you wouldn't have to have maybe all the sports facilities and all that, but then you're asking, I mean, some kids are as saying as 10 when they go off to middle school. You're asking a 10 or 11 year old, what's your track? And we just didn't feel as um, a district that to create an academy or a magnet school for a middle school is the best option. So I don't know if that answers your question. Any other questions? Let me move on to the uh, Park and Trade Bridge. Anyway, first of all, good job. Thank you. that had come up a lot during the discussions over the past so many months was the idea of repurposing one of those structures um, for other district uh, campuses um, or other purposes. Um, so in our meeting today, we really couldn't pin down which campus to repurpose um, because there are pros and cons to each. Um, so what we did instead is we thought, well, if Forest Trail is the one we go with as an elementary school, this is how we'll do it. And then Ms. Gusick will present the part if Valley View was the one that stays in elementary school. That's how we would do it. And then we also, since we were doing that avenue and thinking one of those would be repurposed, after 
Ms. Dusik's part, we'll talk about a possible new elementary school and what that might look like. So, this here is Forest Trail. Um, Forest Trail has some limitations in terms of the topography. There's some uh, floodplains in the back. There's also some um, steep slopes that kind of prevent some of the additions that we would like to add on or would like to see to add on. Um, some of the changes that we were able to make with our growing, we have a small growing population, about one to two percent a year, so we're anticipating some more classes to be added in the next 10 years. Um, so our aim was to at least have five classes per grade level. So in order to accommodate that, um, actually let me back up a little bit and tell you how it looks originally. This is what it hopefully will look like in 10 years as an idea. Currently our library is downstairs. This is the lower level that's actually underneath this level here. Um, we have some third grades. This is representing some portables that have been there a very long time. So one of the ideas we came up with and ironed out was moving our library from underground into a central area. We currently have a courtyard there which we could close off and extend the courtyard into this area here which was two classrooms which we make up for later and making that a large library which then makes it a central location for all the campuses. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, also, that allows, since the library will be a little larger than it currently is, it allows for some more flexible grouping and some small group work within there as well. Um, we have also arranged that each grade level has five. We added four classrooms onto the end of this wing here, um, and that seems to be a safe area where we are able to build. Um, one of the ideas we had toyed around with was going up, um, but unfortunately a lot of the structures there are not made to be able to support a second level at this point. So, by adding four classrooms here, we were able to keep kinder and first down here with a support staff member here, um, whether it be special ed or response to intervention to help struggling students or even advanced students, a GT program. Third grade, we then move into where the library is downstairs. So they are no longer in the portables. And now they, we can repurpose that area. Square footage, it works out okay. So we can still get four classrooms into here and move, keep the fifth one that's already been inside. That'll finally get those kids to feel more part of our campus. Again, we can put a support staff there to help support those staff. Second grade is here, where it currently is as well. And then fifth grade and fourth grade are over here also with their own support staff. This way, support staff can more, um, more efficiently address the needs of all the students more quickly um, as they see fit, as teachers and students and parents see fit. Um, we also went ahead and thought about the idea of extending, right now our, our administration office is this section. We extended over there to allow for more um, staff collaboration, our professional learning communities. Right now it's a very small room where you can fit one grade level in, but if you want some more vertical alignment or more staff members to share ideas or involve more parents meetings and such, we need more room for a larger, uh, larger table um, and other areas. We also, since there's discussion about the CDC being distributed out in different satellite locations, that would be also an opportunity for another location for a CDC. You're done. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's Forest Trail. I'll pass it over to Ms. Dusik here for, oh wait, I'm sorry. This was a close-up of how the library would look. I meant to, took more pictures and I didn't use them. There's the third grade. Uh, that's the old library that we now made in the third grade classrooms. And there's the overview again. So now over to Valley View. Valley View, uh, we are so very fortunate because Valley View really is a campus that can expand. We have space on either side. If you're facing Valley View, when you pull up, you can see the portables to the left, and then our play area, our gymnasium to the right, and we have space on both sides to actually extend Valley View. So if you think of the box expanding. So that, that's really a nice feature. We also have a lot of outdoor space um, and kind of some dead zones right outside um, the cafeteria, which, as you heard, for a third middle school lends itself nicely to be able to expand. Um, what we talked about is the structure and bones of Valley View are really nice. The school flows um, beautifully. Um, one of the things that we really have as a benefit is the traffic flow. So our long drive-in, our nice um, curvature to be able to get traffic in and out. Um, so that, that could really accommodate if an elementary school were here that were larger or a third middle school, um, whatever the case might be, or if indeed it remained, um, well I already said that, uh, elementary school. So some of the things we looked at, we're leaving it very much like it is in the sense of um, grade levels being potted together, being a, a community of learners together. And then what we talked about was we actually looked at this as a full grade level and then across the hallway having any kind of small group setting that you might need or collaborative group for any kind of specialized program or instruction right across the hallway. 
We also, is talking about expanding to the left and the right of the building, we expanded so that you could have either more classrooms, upstairs and downstairs, or you could do commons areas. So you could have large spaces where um, 100, 150 kids could gather, um, kind of what Mr. Ramsey talked about, where instruction could occur um, in large group setting with kids or be broken down into multiple um, size groups. So this is the upstairs. On the bottom portion where we got really excited is we talked about really opening up the space to have a really nice size collaboration media center, um, so making our library um, much larger. Again, because we've got an upper level and a lower level, we're able to extend outside, so we've got the advantage of both top and bottom. One of the things that we really um, uh, liked was the idea of using more of this space right here where you're seated as instructional, making it classrooms another area, and pushing the cafeteria out to the deck space, and actually having the cafeteria function as an indoor-outdoor facility. So um, one of the things I envisioned were the garage doors that open up. So on those beautiful days, you really could open up and have seating area in and out and learning areas that could extend when the cafeteria tables are put away. So we talked about um, that outdoor learning experience is really important um, district-wide. The yellow right here represents an awning. Uh, we talked about the challenges when there is inclement weather or raining weather, um, the types of things that you would need for any, um, any students that you were serving. So that's all the yellow is there. It's just being able to go outside and load buses and get into cars without getting poured on. Um, currently, our, our process in bad weather takes about um, 45 minutes to get a bus at a time under the portico and get everybody off safely without whenever there's lightning or, or rain, which happens about twice a year. So <laughs> that's really good. Not a major obstacle. So I think that pretty much covers value. Any questions about forest trailer value? Okay, good. Next. <laughs> One thing I had failed to mention, or I've forgotten to mention actually beforehand, when we were talking about the two areas, that whichever elementary did stay pretty much as an elementary campus, the Forest Trail students and population would be in that building. So if it stayed Forest Trail, then those Forest Trail kids would stay there. If it was Valley View that became a state of the elementary school, the Forest Trail kids would go there because that is closer to their home community. The other land we were considering for a new elementary campus was the River Hills, um, off River Hills Road, um, which could support a new campus with a different idea that we came up with. This one here is just two layers, and you'll see over there on one of the tables that this here is actually raised up a little bit. That is on top of this area here. Front end, entrance down here. The media admin will be in the front, media center in the back, so your library, computer centers, and everything, as well as all the second level could look down upon the library and the media center down there. All along the outside are pairs of classrooms that could be combined into two or just separate. Um, and all kinder first and second is down on the first level. Some of third and the rest of third, fourth, and fifth is above where the art music is as well. We also have our cafeteria and PE outside over there. That allows for if there's any community meetings or any other uses for it, especially after school, um, for maintenance and stuff, it's, it's such it's easy to keep the air conditioning going and those supplies going over there as opposed to keeping the whole, um, the whole building structure air conditions and such. Also, outside of each pair, there is exit to the outside, and these are all outdoor learning areas. So there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration with other staff members if you want to have two classes out there talking about gardens. Um, and all those areas would be covered by the extension of the outside of this. Um, Your outdoor areas would be shaded by the, by the level above it. We also love the idea that you could send students in collaborative groups right here if there were windows and glass to be able to see them outside of. You can also, Sorry. And you could also, uh, you could also, from up above, we were talking about the ideal of being able to send students to the media center of the library to be able to work and work in small groups, and you'd be able to step outside your classroom across the corner and look down at them and be able to supervise. And really, every adult in the building could be supervising the media center so students could have some independence and autonomy as they work. Another idea that we also incorporated into this was the idea that since this is a new structure, we can make sure there's six classes per grade level, which allows for 800 students, 810 I believe it was, um, and that will also alleviate a lot of the portables and overcrowding, some of the portables that <coughs> result in the overcrowding of other campuses. So by making this one larger, you can also alleviate all the campuses in some regards as well. And we did not, just because we merely ran out of time, did not design um, for CDC for the Child Development Center. But of course, that's a priority district-wide, so it uh, could certainly be something incorporated.
right, so what we were, my team, and by my team I mean me, was tasked with today was looking at a 10 year plan. So obviously, where would Barton Creek be in 2022? Throughout this process, I've learned a lot about impervious cover. <laughs> More than I ever thought I would possibly ever need to know. So here's what I'll boil it down to for Barton Creek. There's no place to build. Um, we are covered up. And so you'll notice on, on the picture that the first thing that I drew an arrow to is a second floor. Because by 2022, we will outstrip our capacity to hold the number of students that we have currently. Uh, will be larger than we have capacity for now. So we have to go up. Um, I do need a disclaimer, way back in the back, there's a red uh, solo cup that is not a future water tower. <laughs> that was my tea that I forgot to remove from the picture. So, so this is Barton Creek in 2022, and so the, the major player here is the fact that we are looking at a second level. So let's look at what the second level would look like. I'll walk up here, there's uh, lots of arrows, and it's a little confusing. What we looked at was the idea behind how do you take an existing structure, and since we can only build up, then what do we do? Uh, to be able to meet the needs of 21st century learning and teaching, to be able to create those open, flexible spaces, and also be able to create an environment where what our students and our children tell us they want, and what they want are places to gather, places to be alone, and places to work in small groups. So how do we incorporate those things? So what we first started off with is obviously you'll see that each of our corridors has a second floor. And what we have done though is blocked out where these would normally be classrooms. Tear down those walls and create open common areas between grade levels. So we're talking about areas that have lots of natural lighting, lots of comfortable furniture, lots of open spaces where teachers can meet with small groups, teachers can large groups, children can meet with each other. When our parent volunteers come in to work with our students, if you come into Barton Creek, you will see them in the hallway on the floor with the children. This creates an opportunity on both levels, on the bottom and the top level on each one, for those open common areas. Um, on each of, each of the two main corridors, so this is our primary wing, and this is our secondary, or our intermediate wing, third, fourth, and fifth. What you'll also see is we, in thinking in 10 years, this is where our computer lab currently is. I don't see those being viable in 10 years. Mobile learning uh, is only going to go further and faster than it is now. We don't see the need for a computer lab. Unless you're running specific software and things like that, there will be pockets that you'll need those things for, but in general, no. So what we would do is turn our computer lab into a community collaborative space. So when our Brewster Club needs to meet and talk about fundraisers or big events, or when we have uh, parents that need to come in and work on science day, or when we have large groups of teachers that need to meet, we do what everybody else does, we meet in the cafetorium or whatever big space you have. This creates part of that for us, also fills a need that our community has. Uh, we have lots of community entities that want to use our space, well, when they do, they have to use our cafeteria, which is not always uh, the right space. This would create that for us. So in looking at this, if we went to a second level, what you'll notice then is from here, we now have a dual stairs that will feed each of these corridors, an atrium, and also an elevator for ADA compliance issues. But if you've been to Barton Creek, you'll notice it's a very dark building, not a lot of natural light. This is our library, which was currently here. We would physically push it back and create an atrium, well-lit area with stairs on either end, an elevator there, that creates more flexible common space for the children. Pushes our library, which we consider in 10 years will really be a media center. Uh, we're seeing more and more books go to online versions, things of that nature. Still will have you know, what books that we need, but we see a big, open, flexible space there that allows us to be able to do, we push that back, and if we add our second second floor, then we regain that space by building on top. So that's what you see here is a stair atrium, well-lit area that is the heart of the building, uh, which also will give us a lot of natural light for our main corridor. And what you'll see in our other wing is the same thing, open common area on both floors, 
collaborative spaces for these light blue things that you can see here. That's for teacher professional learning time. It's also can be for small group pullout, uh, parent-teacher conferences. Those are the common areas that our teachers need that they do not currently have. They currently meet in each other's rooms. Sometimes that's not necessarily conducive to the type of work that they do, or when you're meeting with more than one group of parents. So that allows us to do that. We see the value in CDC, which we did currently have here on our campus. We kept CDC, but we moved them to where my basketball courts are currently. It's a large, flat area, which does not mess with the purpose cover, so we're good there. Can be built on. Um, we would have to see over time, would it be big enough to house as many children as we have currently. They could build their CDC there. And then the last thing you'll see is um, our current playground is here. We've outstripped our capacity for that. Adding on to, it says new playground, but this would be an addition that would stretch our current playground out because um, currently if you come out the recess, it looks like ants and picnic. There are too many children not in space. So that takes care of that issue for us as well. I think I covered all of the conceptual ideas, and again, this is looking 10 years down the road at us roughly being at over 600 students and no place for them to go, so no place to build, so then we, we go up. Any questions for me about Martin Creek before I jump into trying to discuss what they did at Bridgeport? Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, anything going on with that back field? That You're talking about a field that is up uh, this direction. It is currently not utilized and one of the things we talked about and I've talked with Bob Serby and I've talked to, with several district personnel about is that field can be turned into a rental facility. That's where they can have your Westlake youth soccer and those types of things because this field will shrink in size if we put or extend our playground which needs to happen. This becomes a smaller field um, and Honestly, it gets a lot of wear and tear from rentals, and so when our kids go out to play on it, it's mostly dirt. Uh, that can give us the relief that we need. We do have a field up at the top. It's not useful for anything that we would need, need it for, but it can still be used for facility rentals for outside entities. Was that what you were talking about? Yeah, I just, I just know it's a space that I've yep. noticed doesn't seem to get used, so I mean, it's like the field is either made bigger and... Better. Oh, you're absolutely I accurate. It's it's or maybe some other use. No, it's, and it's a good size uh, field for soccer or for any of the, the outside events to rent our current facilities. Yeah, just touch it. Okay, so, anybody here from Bridgepoint? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I've been in Bridgepoint about 10 times, so I'm gonna do my best here. Uh, they weren't able to be with us. They were at the table with us working, so I'm gonna do my best to describe what they did at Bridgepoint. Bridgepoint is one of the few schools that has buildable space. So they have space around their property where they can actually put more buildings, other, other facilities uh, within their existing area. So what I did was I took a picture so you can see that Bridgepoint is a multi-level multi -level campus. Very few changes that they made uh, structurally, they were more how they organized the kids and the classrooms within that structure. So by pods, by grade levels. And so, but I will tell you two things that are new I'll show you in just a second. Uh, this area right here that's pink, they talked about making that an open common area for students, a place for them to gather, a uh, place with lots of natural light. That was one of the things that they did add. You'll see on their second level, these pink squares, those are common collaborative classrooms. So where teachers can have PLCs, where they can meet also a place where kids can be pulled for small group instruction that keeps them closer to their peers instead of in most buildings having to go off down the hallway to a different classroom. So that's what accounts for those pink squares that you see. Can you touch it one time? So taking off of that, you see what the first floor is. And the same, it's the same structure um, that they currently have, just how they've organized their different grade levels. And if you touch the last slide, I'll show you what the change so, these are the collaborative spaces they talked about adding. The one big change they did make was here, and this is a place they can build. And what they talked about building was art. This would be an art area with an RTI, response to intervention in the classroom. And this is a place where they can actually build a structure so they have that flexibility. 
And so they talked about being able to move where their existing art classroom is, which I can't tell you because I'm not that familiar with the building, but to build a new building here or a new addition to it with an RTI classroom to meet the needs of those students. But for theirs, the structure, there weren't massive changes, not like you would have seen, say, at Martin Creek. Any questions for me about uh, Bridgepoint in 2022? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I have a request from the high school to present. <laughs> As we have students who need to. Yeah, so high school, you want to come on up? Lisa for letting us, uh, but Faraj uh, and uh, Will have been with us all day, this is Faraj Mehta, and uh, they've been active on Dr. Carter's CLT throughout the uh, last six months, and I wanted to have their voice uh, today as they talk a little bit about the high school, um, and Will already had to leave, so I wanted to go ahead and let Faraj speak a little bit at the beginning, um, and then I'll come back and fill in so that he can, uh, he can go there. You know, it's pretty good when you have high school students uh, give up a day of their summer vacation uh, to spend uh, 12 to 15 hours. They've been here since 7 30 this morning. So I'll turn it over to Barash. So, um, so uh, last time I was I was here, I, I talked to you all about what a day at Westlake was like. And no doubt it's a great school, it's a great place to learn, it's a great place to be. But there were a couple problems that made it kind of inconvenient and a little less than and so we, on a big scale, those turn into big problems when there's 2,500 kids there. So a couple of the highlights for Houston Watt is we will have some kind of pedestrian overpass across West Bank as we're going to have some other developments up there and the traffic flow is getting dangerous really. Uh, another thing is we're going to connect the third floors of the, of the ninth grade center and the science hall because there needs to be a little bit more classroom space and social space up there, along with like poor flow of traffic in the building. A third thing was the, the addition of some room for robotics where the NOC is next to the shop court, as they are really under, under spaced right now and they need the, need the room. It's going to free up a little bit of classroom space because Westlake will be a couple hundred kids under what we need in 10 years. And so that's a lot of classroom space to let the, less, the rest of the school be more flexible with how they use classrooms and also have room for the new kids that should be coming out. So all those things are really important to us as students. And then there are a lot of extra enrichment programs that Coach Bill will we'll talk to you about that. Thank you. Thank you. For that. Special. My name is Al Bennett. I'm assistant athletic director, head volleyball coach, and I also teach AP US history. So I have three different levels of uh, interest on that. All three of my children graduated from West, uh, West Lake High School. With my last, uh, having missed part of the symposium, I had to go to my daughter's graduation from Notre Dame. So I'm now out of the college tuition business, so I guess I have a lot of, I'm getting a big raise, Dr. Wellman, this year. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank my committee that our team that worked together, Liz McWhorter today, Donna Jackson, who's an AP, um, Stephen Shans, who's an AP, who was here earlier, John Haven Strike, hope I got that right, John, uh, Viraj, who you just heard from, and Will first. Um, well, myself, along with Carrie Taylor, were, <coughs> Carrie Taylor was the chair, I was the vice chair, had the, the, the great opportunity to do enrichment um, uh, uh, activities for the district. And so I've actually been bopping around to all of the different uh, uh, tables today as we've tried to put it together, but I'm going to focus specifically about the high school. Um, you heard Will and Brad, and he actually heard them the first time, was really good as they talked about some of the problems, and we feel like we, those guys have sat with us today and said, hey, you've addressed a lot of the issues that students have at Westlake High School. We figure by 2022, if I'm not, 
and, and guys correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're going to be about 2,900 approximately. We're presently about 2,485. We'll probably be over 2,500 for the next year. So we'll still continue to see some growth. Um, here are our talking points. Um, we wanted to make sure that we responded to our current needs um, and programs with an eye to the future. So we still have to look and address current needs that we're facing right now on our, com our, on our campus, as well looking to the future. Uh, we want to really look, at, and we got excited about the things that the Cunningham Group took us through and brought us, about looking for a flexible instructional space. Um, and like all of our campuses throughout the district, storage is a common occurrence. As, as Carrie and I met with parent groups, we met with um, different um, in, um, extracurricular, co-curricular activities, there was a common word that was spoken in every report that we received, and it was storage. Um, we want to talk about uh, what the impact would be about moving uh, non-instructional services off, off the immediately, immediate Westlake High School campus. We want to integrate the main Westlake campus, and Raj talked about that with the ninth grade center. Need to try to address safety and parking, um, and those two kind of go hand to hand. If you've been in the parking lot at 405 or 410, sometimes you can take your life in the hands either from a student, a parent, or a teacher. So it could be a variety of opportunities there. Um, we also are looking at joint venture opportunities um, that I'll walk through and talk through our, our, our site uh, plan uh, with uh, food trailers and then a community center multi-purpose facilities. And then the last thing we wanted to incorporate was additional outdoor learning uh, spaces that we could put into our campus. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to start from the east and go west. So this is West Bank Drive. Um, one of the things that well, is fairly significant, and you uh, saw this in the earlier presentation, was this is transportation and maintenance. And so we just took uh, Bill and, or uh, took Bob and Tim's home, and we wanted to make that additional uh, parking space uh, spaces because we're going to end up absorbing some other parking spaces in other areas. Let me preface everything that we do. We are in three jurisdictions. We are in the city of Austin. Travis County and Westlake Hills. And they all have different rules, they're not the same. So this would be uh, a parking, additional parking area. Um, this is a parking for competitions and other activities, as well as student parking. We would have a two-story facility that would be built on the, where the existing um, bus barn is and maintenance facility that would be a uh, wrestling room, uh, locker rooms, and then on top there would be an instructional uh, um, uh, learning, uh, help me Bill, it was uh, professional learning activities where a lot of different groups could come in and use this area, it would have its own separate parking um, that would be able to be used uh, for different types of uh, professional learning that would occur within the community and within our school district uh, across other areas. Um, we've looked at restructuring parking but and, and um, travel zone, but we're going to leave that to the experts and the traffic persons. You know, we kind of came up with our own ideas and that didn't necessarily, um, aren't too structurally or intelligent. They were intelligent to us, sorry Liz, but they were, uh, they were you know, something we had to work on. Notice that we do correct a, a, a bridge or a walkway from this parking lot here that would take us into the ninth grade center. Um, I'm going to go this direction. This is fairly significant here. Um, Barrage talked about the tower. This is presently the, the old original uh, gymnasium. It's where we have dance and cheer, our house there presently. And we talked about as well as soccer locker rooms, as well as baseball locker rooms, as well as uh, Highline locker rooms, showers, and our visitors when we have uh, football games on Friday nights. So we talked about basically this is going to blow up. And when it blows up, it's going to be rebuilt. It's going to be called the tower. Um, and uh, that's Farage's name. And it basically would include and continue to include some locker room spaces. It would be also, um, we were looking at um, academic, uh, struck, uh, academic studies. There's going to be different things that would be layered in this building. It presently houses journalism, yearbook, multimedia, uh, and Emily McIntyre's uh, RTF. And so it would create more flexible space and give up more opportunities for the rest of the uh, buildings to be changed to accommodate that. And then I'll show you where I'm going to put some of those, act those or where we agreed to put those activities. We talked about, we talked about the connection that was right there a minute ago, it's on that way. Right here, this will be where we will connect 
from the Ninth Grade Center. That's the third floor that goes over basically that roof that you look over the Ninth Grade Center. We talked about increasing that. Um, it helps with the traffic flow. It helps with additional uh, flexible spaces and learning areas. An atrium here that would be, um, um, what you guys call this list? The Green Garden. Green yeah, garden. Green Garden. Green, green Garden, thank green you. Um, I would not, I, I would kill everything that grew on there because that's what happens to my yard, but that's what, that would go in that particular area there. If you go north, we talked about, or south, we talked about the two bridges. Um, we're talking at, all the way up here at the tennis complex of, of revenue generating, where we would actually put uh, lights that would be, there's different things that we can do to control them, that would also uh, allow us to fence some of that area in that would give us the opportunity to generate revenue. Those are used on, during all daylight hours and not necessarily used by uh, school individuals and it's very hard to supervise that and that would give us some opportunity. If you look at the very top, this is a turf practice field, it's a grass field. Uh, we're looking at expanding that, creating the turf. We've got a lacrosse wall that's up there and uh, we go just underneath the uh, turf practice field. We have our, the, this is the cannon plot. This would be uh, the old Buchanan house. We'd be looking at a trailer court, food court that was mentioned earlier, a bridge that would access across that. That field could be completely dedicated. Um, basically, it gets used pretty much by lacrosse and by uh, Westlake Youth Soccer, um, uh, Pop Warner. Um, lots of different groups are back up there. Um, but it would also give us the flexibility of uh, running, playing more lacrosse games there, et cetera. Come back down to the school, we go to the main building and come over, um, redo the front entrance, try to get some better parking facilities or access to this area as a drop off zone. Oh, that's the lobbies. We're going to move the, the knock. The knock would, is presently where IT and our uh, uh, IT area is. And this has uh, outside access as well as. Uh, doors that make it easy, unlevel doors that make it easy to move our robotics program equipment in and out of that area, load up their trucks and do what they need to do. Um, presently they're not located in this area right over here um, in a very small room and they certainly have outgrown um, their, um, uh, the facilities that they present ha presently have. Um, we, there's a dead wall here in a green space right there that we would make the athletic office which in turn frees up more space for David Poole as he's operating out of, the, out of a couple closets, some of the stuff that he does for the Performing Arts Center. Um, as you know, we would have lost this gym here. And so we had Highline and dance classes and Cheerlead to, to, uh, to move around as well as some other activities. We would have moved Cheerleading into the ninth grade center, increased our storage. We already had the locker rooms and showers available. It's PE and it's actually practices in the morning. It's PE all day and then cheerleading would be able to have it uh, from eighth period on as long as they need it. Then it's open up for community afterwards. We would add uh, a gymnasium on this side here that would be a full-size gymnasium. The ninth grade center is a junior high size gymnasium. Um, the old gym that we have here was full-size. This would put a full-size gymnasium in this area here. Uh, which would help alleviate some of the problems that we're having right now in terms of scheduling and how late we bring students back at night to get all the practices and uh, activities in. Now you would say, Where, what, what, what are we going to do with dance? Well, Carrie and I talked about dance, and what we would be doing would be coming out the end of the performance, uh, performance or, or the fine arts performance area. Originally, the dance room was the green room. And so in 85 when it was built. So what would happen now is we put our dance room here. Band also has need for showers, um, locker rooms. We have winter guard that's exploded in the last 10 to 15 years. And so we have to find places. That puts them sharing the same facility. And as you can hear, the common thread is that we're multi-using facilities so that they're getting used by multiple groups. So they would use that facility from 6.30 in the morning until 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night and it would be used every period of the day in between that. Um, after that, we come across the street. Um, we moved uh, the administration, so they are now gone with uh, maintenance and transportation, and that's someone else's, no, well, we have a solution to that. Uh, but we're gonna put, as we move this stuff area back over here, we took TLC, and we took the um, DAEP, and moved them into this particular area, 
as well as the knock. And we understand that there may need to be expansion in this particular area. It certainly provides the parking that's needed for those areas. We still have the stone house over here. That's, if we're moving, uh, you know, moving district things out of the Westlake property, um, there may be a, another place where those things potentially could be loaded, uh, moved to. I know that there is a very nice um, office down here that has a great view of all the Westlake High School, and I just again comment. Um, <laughs> we look over here, we go a little bit farther into the old the Shriner uh, area, and we've looked at a um, community center that's going to in involve three or four different areas. This would be a large 80 by 50 um, uh, indoor area that could accommodate all sorts of different uh, uh, groups that could use it throughout the day. It's one of those joint venture partnerships like the food court that we feel that we have some uh, great opportunities with that. There would be um, a swimming pool that would be associated with it that could be managed by this point uh, joint venture group that would certainly take away the liability away from the school district uh, and anything associated with that. Additional parking that goes with that. Um, one of the things that came out of our committee was the was a elementary middle school uh, performing arts center for all their activities, for choir, concerts, band, uh, orchestra. You heard uh, Mr. Uh, Ramsey talk about uh, the large numbers of kids that we have participating in those things, and there's really no places. This is their place where they maybe run them uh, on their campuses, and this would give them that. And that was a common thing that we heard in our committee from all the elementary schools and the middle schools, from parents and teachers in those areas alike was the, the need for this particular area. It, or opportunity. This is something that may end up being over on that western uh, River Hills uh, property, but it's something that we incorporated here. We moved transportation over here, and we did put the administration over here on the old shooting range of the Shriner. And I don't know if there's any hidden meeting with that. But we thought we would put them at least 10 over here, and we wanted to make sure that they weren't um, neglected. Last thing I would make, uh, like to mention is we talked, one of the major concerns we have is parking. And this would be a parking structure. This is at the north end of the stadium lot. We still have to have access here for emergency vehicles to the field. Um, as much as we don't want to ever have that access, we do need it and have needed it many times. So this access would remain, but this would be a parking structure. And as we talked to our students, they found that parking structure much easier to access from here than any other parking structure in different locations around. Because we will be redoing some of the parking um, that would be in this particular area here and having to restructure that with the people that know best how to do that. <laughs> Did I forget anything, committee? The yes? The cross country trail. Oh, my cross country trail. Sorry. This, country. Trail. this is, would be a trail that um, we felt that could be used by a lot of different groups as well as the community um, that would be basically a 5K trail uh, that we would be putting in um, that could be used not only by our um, cross country, male and female cross country athletes, but different community groups. Uh, that would be a walking, running trail that would circumvent the entire um, Shiner property. John, anything? I think you can, we, part of our thinking was that you would actually be able to uh, link uh, through to the, to the Valley View and Forest Trail track uh, and that this, this cross-country trail would provide some sort of uh, connection. Yes. And the little triangle green says amphitheater. Oh, yes. Oh, that's the thing. Thank you, thank you. On the back side, there's a little hill on the back side. Oh, oh, there you go. That might, you can put one there too, maybe. You had an amphitheater right here, which would be the back side of the, of the, of the present PE gym, and that drops down. That would provide an amphitheater for all sorts of uh, act outdoor learning activities. Okay. Any questions? All right, good job. Thanks.
team did a lot of work in one day. I kind of showing you what our existing reality is right now. Um, you know, it's interesting. Many of the schools are looking at going to a pod formation where uh, classrooms and teachers and students can collaborate and work together. Well, Eans Elementary was built on the idea that pods already exist. Um, our current problem is, though, that each of the teaching pods have four classrooms in them. And our current reality is that every grade level has five teachers in the grade level. Well, that creates a problem because you have four teachers in pod and one teacher that's removed. So the whole collaboration process is great for the four, but not so great for the one. So it doesn't make a very cohesive team. So um, in looking and moving into the future, the demographers say that we're going to be inside for a, a very long time. So, um, and then also, this kind of also shows you um, the exist, existing walking pathways throughout the school. It's very meandering. Um, the ADA work can be um, very intricate and you know, difficult to make work, and so um, that's kind of the existing pathways throughout the school. You'll see when we show you our proposed plan that um, we've created two major pathways that lead you through the entire campus that make it just a lot, more, uh, a lot easier to travel the campus, which is spread out over a large um, piece of land that is all down the hillside. So. All righty. This is our proposed um, design that we worked on today. We had a lot of fun with this. I'm going to flip it back to existing. Existing. Show the main entry is on BK. The main entry is here, coming in on BKs. And this now, being the main offices. This actually flips the campus so that this really uh, presents the, uh, the back side of the campus then with the entry up there at the front. Um, so you go in off campcraft and the entry for the school would be top there where the red is at the top. The red indicates uh, administrative offices. And uh, it also creates two main kind of spines that go through the campus that lead you um, to the main parts of the campuses. Um, I forgot about the anchor piece, but I'm sorry. Okay. Oh. So one of the positive things about this is we're able to keep a, almost the majority of our existing structures and we'll go through there's one one of the original pods that we are removing which then enables us to in a very thoughtful respectful way to existing architecture add on and create those five classroom pods that we need um, this central spine would then uh, be anchored at both ends at the top of your b cave that would be a library with um, additional shared spaces, the red areas, shared spaces, that could then serve as community access with a parking nearby. And at the bottom, at the new entry facility uh, with this admin, it would also be um, a cafeteria, and what I didn't circle, the other big orange block uh, in the upper right would be a gymnasium. Both of those would be facilitated uh, with a parking area and also be open to the public. So that really your campus is bordered by these two main anchors that are public, um, in their opportunities, and the interior academic part of the campus can be kept separate. And a nice piece for the parents is that right, the way we have it right now is the cafeteria is at the bottom of the campus, and access of the campus and the offices are at the top of the campus. 
So when you're coming to have lunch with your child, which many parents do, uh, then you're checking in at the top of the campus and you're having to walk all the way down. If you think it's not that far, it is. It's probably a five minute walk from there. To there. So, uh, you know, when you're on your lunch break from work and you want to run in and have lunch with your child, it's not super easy. So that kind of orients those two sections together and just makes it easier for parents. All right, so this is, imagine you flip to the other side of the campus now. This, this would be the new front of the school. This would be the administrative offices. This is the cafeteria area. Uh, you can see a new drive has been created to, um, to come on, on this side of the school and around. This would be a covered walkway that would lead into the front of the school so that you can have um, two drop-offs. We can have buses coming in this way, and then we have parent pickup, which can take this drive right here, so that uh, basically on rainy days and things like that, we're able to you know, house kids here and get them off the buses and get them into cars. One of the challenges we have at our campus is we currently have three different places where kids need to go at the end of school. You've got the upper car, You've got the lower car, which is really in the middle of campus, and then you've got the buses all the way at the bottom. And so every day, I think you know, 20 minutes before the end of the day, and the teachers have to start sorting their kids, figuring out who goes where. There's all this confusion of someone wanting to go on a play date and they're in the wrong spot, you know. So um, it's very um, chaotic and takes quite a bit of time. This centralizes all of the kids into one opportune drop-off pickup location, both bus and and it mitigates the need for cars during the day to come into the central part where you see that um, drive. We can use that area for parking, but we don't need to actually use it for cars. Right here, and we are in dire need of extra parking. Whenever we have events, we're always parking on the streets and uh, you know, in the neighborhood where we can borrow and parking from Trinity, they're always borrowing from us. So to use this central drive area for extra parking and for this to be the main access for drop off and pickup would be hugely helpful. There is this one opportunity where the yellow house is, if you could show them that one little holdout right is here. Yeah, that would probably be currently owned by the district. If that were to become available, it of course would, would factor in and, and even present some more optimal solutions for ad admin location and, and how many people can drop off. But right now, that's not feasible. Um, I'm going to flip to our reasoning behind the pod. Okay. Um, like we said in the beginning, um, you know, we currently have a poor classroom reality for every grade level that has five, uh, five sets of students at each grade level. And so um, you'll see that, oh, will you go back to the other real quick? Oh, okay, got it, you're good. Right now what we have is four pods. One, two, three, four, here in the center. Um, there's also a pod down at the end and a pod up near the library too. But these are the four main kind of self-sustaining pods out in the middle of um, campus. So what we are proposing is that in order to keep the idea of pods and the outside feel of, of our um, school district is to take um, three of the pods and add on to them. So for example, um, this pod here is the second grade pod that leads out into, right, am I right? Yeah, yeah. that leads out, this is like a covered area right now out by the second grade pod. And so we would um, add on to it, get an extra classroom, a collaboration space that they can share, small group, breakout space, um, and then also some support classrooms for either GT, special ed, any special programs that might need this. So that this pod creates kind of even a longer pod than even the, the five or six classroom model. You can see on the other areas, you can add that similar fifth classroom plus the flex space at the gable ends of those pods, but you can see it begins to compromise um, the space and the circulation. The circulation being the orange pathway and the areas that are circled yellow, you can see where there's gonna be an overlap of, of structure uh, that creates some um, unpleasant spaces. Right. So we propose that we take one pod away, take away this pod right here, Basically, right now this is a courtyard. Basically, we extend the courtyard to be an outside learning space throughout this entire area right here. That allows us to extend this pod and this pod so that we create two, two situations where we have five classrooms and a breakout collaboration space for each of those two pods. We then would add over um, on the left, we'd add 
add a new pod that would be in the same respectful architecture as what's existing, so very much married with what's there, and uh, that would then complete what we would call kind of the academic core of, of the campus. This is what we refer to as the upper playground. It's behind, but if you looked at Oregon, you saw the library here, so this is the upper playground. Currently, this is just portable classrooms right now, and so of course where the portables are, we'd like to build some permanent structures here. Uh, classrooms, uh, flexible classrooms for special programming, science lab, uh, theater lab, those kinds of things, um, and then also create a kindergarten pod right here. I circled this building because it's got an interesting opportunity in that it's built on a hillside, and this purple line, if you were to cut right through there um, and look through it from the side, you can see that from the top, the playground area, that kindergarten pod could appear to be the same scale as the rest of the other one-story pods. But then as you drop down the hill from the back side, um, you would begin to have the opportunity to tuck more program space underneath it. And so even though it's a two-story structure on our campus, it wouldn't feel out of place just because of the topography. Um, and that's the Split style. level, yeah. kind of like a condo, you know, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the playground. Right. Now, real estate. So this, this drawing shows kind of where we see removing some of what's on campus. I don't know if you want to but identify those Taking out the portables, um, again, losing this third, uh, this fourth pod right here. These are portables right here, um, but by creating the extra learning spaces um, here and adding on to each pod, these are portables that we can remove and create more outdoor learning space. You guys know, uh, if you've been to Ease Elementary, it's in the garden. We could extend the garden. We could create some outdoor learning center here, too. And kind of recapture that space. Also, it doesn't threaten to take away the play field here. We were worried that, you know, eventually we might have to build right there on the field, but um, the plan that we have here is actually save that space for us. And here's one last look at, so that's what we want, the whole structure. Uh, that's the new area. Those are the new areas. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. One of the things we didn't really talk about at the top is um, we separated the cafeteria and the gym and created a new gymnasium. Um, our gymnasium is probably half the size of what a gymnasium needs to be for the number of students that we have. And so um, we've created a new gymnasium over there and separated it from the cafeteria. So the existing cafeteria gym would be one big cafeteria and give us more space. And it would allow, just like Valley enjoys this feature, you can separately lease it out to the community I saw you had an orange building of the gym removed, and then now there's an orange building there. Do you remove it or do you repurpose it? In this situation, what we're showing is that we would remove that, partly because um, <clears throat> as we begin to bring down, that, that's showing it removed, that's showing it new. You can see we've added other program space, significant uh, administrative area, basically the whole entrance to the school. So the needs of that architecture and the function of that space might need to change in enough ways that I would think it would need to be torn down. It's also the least um, or the most poorly designed building on our campus in terms of, uh, you know, notability. Any other questions? Okay. Well, just a big
again about Cedar Creek Elementary. Um, like Haynes Elementary, it was already built, it was built in the 70s, and it was built in pods. And it was built as an open classroom concept, which we saw a lot in the 70s. And so right now, what you would do is this is the main entrance, and there's a circular area here in the middle that is a hallway. And there's offshoots of pods that go off that main hallway. And so within those pods, it's already, it allows for collaboration because they're glass. So the teachers can look out within the pods. Students work in small areas because, again, that's what we're looking for is collaboration. One of the big things that Cedar Creek, as it is now, doesn't allow for or isn't allowing for is additional growth. And in the last 10 years, we've grown by about 20, or, yeah, about 20%. We've gone from 390 to where in the last year, a little over 500. And so we have gone from having three classrooms per grade level, and what the projection is, is we're going to be having four classrooms per grade level, and we don't have enough classrooms. And so that, is, again, is a concern. And as you heard from other groups, impervious cover is a huge issue, as well as water planes and all kinds of things like that. So what we had talked about is the main, main additions to the school would be to build it out, and this would be administrative area, because we've, we've run out of space for administration as well. And what we have right now isn't real conducive to safety. And so if we could build this out and to, so that we could, again, have additional space in our, our office area, and again, space, as, as you've heard from others, that, that is an issue um, for storage. And then take this additional space that was, this is already a second floor, and there are four classrooms here on the second floor, and that's the only second floor we have. And then have addition, this would be support classes, RTI, special ed, those type of areas would be built here. And then on top of the existing office, actually build another pod for a grade level. And that would give us that classroom space that would again house another grade level. And really, that would be pretty much the only changes that we would make. You know, I say only, it would be building up. But everything else is real conducive to what we had talked about. We already have some outdoor uh, learning spaces. We have two classrooms on outdoors. We did talk about, because we are in Austin, Texas, to put some covering over them. I think they'd be used a little bit more. We already do have a garden. Um, some of those things that we've talked about, we definitely already have. And so really, it's the additional classroom space is what we need. Admin, same things that we have now, the additional couple of offices of counselors. Uh, and as we grow, we most likely have an assistant principal. I don't have an assistant principal now, and, but there's, there's just not the space. And also, again, we would address safety concerns. Mm -hmm. and this, is, this is a site that's been existing in CDC and permanent. It is. It, and it's here in the back. It's a complete separate building. It's the annex, and there's six classrooms back there. Um, Again, it's completely separate from the rest of the building. And what we have found is it's perfect for the CDC because there's access to the campus here off of, of Walsh Carlton and they go directly in the back for drop off. Um, what I told several people today that I was looking at, sure you don't want to just use that <laughs> for your additional classrooms. Again, it's not conducive because it's not within the, the building and again, presents safety concerns, in my, you know, what we talked about, as well as just for teacher retention and um, pro teacher group productivity, I found having a CDC on campus has been extremely, extremely beneficial. Uh, I was telling someone earlier today that over the last, I've had the CDC for eight years, we put it in. Um, I've had over 30 babies born on my campus, and I've only lost two teachers. And that, that speaks volumes uh, for the CDC. I've had teachers move to Kyle, or they even um, Round Rock and Cedar Park, and they stay because it's, 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 it's worth it teach your employees happy. And also, it's a, it's a fundraiser. Um, raise our funds for the district. Yes? Um, I'm just going to talk. I think it's recently got
So they're really not suitable for classroom, but even if you took them away, it would be impervious to ever. We wouldn't be able to use it before the building. Great, great help. 